Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2020 Wolfpack Warrior Workshop. Uh, we have a really good panel coming up right now. I'm excited for it. We've got our former co-national director, Allison Hartson, here, who is now the TYT community director. And we've got our community uh, uh, director down in Florida, Kristen Peluso, who uh, has just been an absolute rock star. And also, they're both, by the way, teachers, come from teaching backgrounds. And uh, which we always welcome very much here uh, in our organizing department. So um, what, we're, what you're going to learn is how to build and maintain a team, one of the most critical aspects of getting this, this change that we want. So I just want to remind everyone, if you want to participate, go to wolf slash workshop and you can you can get your ticket and come on inside and like participate in the polls. It's going to be a lot of them coming up in the uh, next couple panels. And we've got a silent auction that ends at 5 p.m. Eastern. And there's a lot of cool stuff there. So that's wolf packcom slash live to check all that out. Just scroll down on the page. And uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Allison and Kristen. So take it away. Thank you. So welcome. It's been an um, action-packed weekend and it's gone by so fast. Um, so today we're going to go over how to build and maintain a team. But before we jump into introductions or the content, we're going to uh, have a poll. We have a question for you to just think about. Can you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. Everybody can see it now? Okay. So when it comes to a business or organization or team, what do you think is more important? Is it the culture or the strategy? And so we'll give you a moment to do that. We'll introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Kristen Peluso. I'm a teacher, the Florida organ. Uh, what a community director, and I'm also part of the leadership council here at Wolfpack. Uh, I joined about four years ago, and I knew Congress was corrupt. There was a problem. They didn't represent we the people. And so I sought out information, and that's when I stumbled upon Wolfpack, and they had a concrete pathway moving forward and um, a way to give me a voice and to make a difference. So I've been here ever since. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Hartson. You can hear me okay, right? The light's not going over to my screen, so I'm not really sure. Okay, good. So I'm Allison Hartson. I currently work for TYT, and I work directly with the TYT Army and our all of our TYT audience, which we lovingly refer to as the TYT community. Prior to that, I was helping Justice Democrats running for office. Prior to that, I ran for office uh, for U.S. Senate in California against Diane Feinstein. And then prior to that, I was the co-national director with Mike for Wolfpack. Prior to that, I was a volunteer for Wolfpack, the California state director. And then before that, I taught high school. I taught English, and then I designed and taught an intervention program for students who were at risk of not graduating high school. And prior to that, I was sane. So it's <laughs> a little about me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Allison. Uh, so we're going to see where the poll is at. And John, if you could give us any of the results. Okay. So currently, uh, looks like 84% of our respondents believe that culture is the more important. Nice. Uh, between culture and strategy. All right, perfect. So we're going to go to Allison and we're going to further discuss um, what the answer is. Let's see if you guys got the answer correctly. It's kind of a trick question, to be honest. Uh, first of all, let me just say, I know there's a lot of information on this page. There's only so much time. And of every bullet point that exists on this entire presentation, I could speak to it for at least an hour. Um, I don't know if that speaks to the subject or how much I like to talk, but maybe a little bit of both. Nevertheless, what I encourage you to do, because I'm not going to go through everything, uh, is to take a screenshot if you want, and hopefully that will be able to help you. But when I first came upon across this particular concept of the uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast, which you can Google and find all kinds of stuff to read about, I it, at the time, the, the argument was that culture, of course, is more important than strategy. You could have the absolute best strategy with your team, but if you don't have a team that is going to stick around to withstand all of the pressures and challenges that come your way, then who cares about the strategy, right? A team that can get along and, and kind of weather the storm. 
But the conversation since then has developed into being more about you really can't do, uh, you really can't have one without the other. And so it's a trick question because one of the options could have been both, right? (laughs) But I just kind of wanted everybody to kind of think about uh, which one you kind of lean towards. And I think that if you, um, one of the things to consider is that you can also have a fantastic team. You can have one where everybody loves each other and everybody gets along and people show up to meetings and they love to go out and have drinks together and eat together, whatever it is. But do you have a strategy? Do you have a winning strategy? Are you are you strategically minded? Um, do you think about deadlines and meet those deadlines? And when things don't work, you come back to the table and you figure out how to work around that. That's why you really have got to have both. So what I've laid out here, what is strategy and what is culture, these bullet points are just examples for you. You could probably think of 5, 10, 15, 50 more examples, but just something to kind of keep in mind. So for example, under what is your strategy? Uh, do you have regular meetings? Are they weekly? Are they monthly? Um, do you, are they consistent? And are they meaningful for people too? But, uh, or are they canceled and rescheduled a lot and kind of happen like when you can get to them and, and when you show up to those meetings, do you have an agenda and are they organized and does everybody have a, a, an opportunity to speak? Does everybody feel comfortable speaking? These are all kinds of questions to be asking yourself and, um, you know, tracking all legislator meetings as, as another example. So is there a place where people track every single meeting so that if you're not around anymore, or maybe you're new and you came to your team and do you have access to the last year or the last few years that your team was around working on that legislation? If you did it, what did, how did that affect your guys's strategy? How did it affect the time that you had to go and figure those things out all over again? Um, culture. The biggest thing I think I would recommend here, at least that really helps me is that Even when I was a teacher, I always tried to think about putting myself in the shoes of my students. And now I I try to put myself in the shoes of the newest volunteer walking into a room or walking into a meeting or joining us in Slack where we do our work with the TYT Army, whatever platform you use, Slack, email, whatever. But, you know, the longer you've been with a team, an organization, a company, a group of friends, the closer you get to the decision making the further you get from that perspective of that brand new person walking in. And that is your culture. Are you welcoming? Are you inclusive? Or are you clicky and exclusive? And you may feel that you're welcoming, um, but are you? I mean, really think about what it feels like when, like when, when that new person joins a meeting, do they know what the hell you're talking about? Do they know on the agenda what's the structure of the agenda and how to read it and how to follow it and what things mean? And so uh, these are things that just really help me to kind of humble myself and take my time and welcome everybody and be patient with all of those questions from, from new people. And as that happens, you see your team grow. You see the veteran people gain in their compassion and their welcoming towards the team. So we're going to look next at the at, at our agenda. The, the, what we're going to to spend the rest of this time, uh, the rest of this particular panel, this discussion, I'm um, talking about. And this here is really the foundation of it all. For me, when I started to think about whatever company I'm working for, whatever organization organization I'm volunteering for, whoever it is I'm I'm helping and, and consulting for. Are uh, taking a look and reflecting at my culture or the culture of that team and the strategy. Does the culture help the strategy? Is the strategy reflecting the culture? It always is, but what is it, it reflecting actually? And so we're going to be sharing with you a few readings that Kristen is going to introduce you to in just a minute, but they all really come back to this culture and strategy. Thank you. So those are all really great points. The one that sticks with me is the being mindful of when a new volunteer comes in. Um, like how Allison was saying, we're going to be using these three books. They contain a wealth of information to help develop out your uh, and create strong teams. Um, and for each one of these four sections, you only have about 10 minutes and an opportunity for maybe one or two questions. 
So as we move through the sections, feel free in Excel events to use the Q&A uh, to ask us questions. Um, unfortunately, there's no way we can cover all this content, um, but we hope to entice you to read it or look on the internet. There's great podcasts, videos, worksheets. And like how Allison said before, feel free to take screenshots. And if you're in Excel events, later we'll send you a PDF of all the content that's on the slides. Um, and yeah, so we'll be sharing information that's based on our experience, what we've learned, what works for us, and then some tips that you can immediately take back and implement in your teams and, and see how they work for you. So I'm going to send it off to Allison. So the starfish and the spider, I think, is a great introduction to these other books that we're going to be talking about because it 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 opens up the uh, so much of what the other books go into more detail about. So it's kind of like an introduction and a good a good platform from which to jump from. And it goes into it it, it breaks down the pros and cons of the two main types of structures in our society, whether it's in our government, whether it's in a company that you work for, or your own team that you're volunteering with. And that is either a centralized, top-down type of decision-making and participation structure, or a centralized, horizontal, people often think of leaderless type of structure. And of course, in our society, we're more comfortable with because that is most common to have a centralized top down. And uh, a lot of us, our knee jerk reaction is to kind of, you know, be anti authoritarian and kick back against it, but also lean towards that when it comes to us making decisions and wanting control over our, our own lives. So what I really enjoyed about this book is that it, it goes a lot into the decentralized portion, what that really means, a lot of misconceptions I had about what decentralization means, and a lot of things that I feel comfortable with, with a centralized organization that actually helps support a decentralized organization. So read it. It's really interesting. See if you, you, if you get the same things from it, probably not, um, and, and, and see how it helps you. But uh, there's a lot of fascinating case studies that this uh, I found really fascinating to prove the bottom line, which is that the hybrid structure is really the conclusion that to take the, 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 all of the benefits of both centralized and decentralized. And they also use science to prove that this is the case. Uh, I thought this was really interesting. Nothing I ever thought about in terms of like whether our brains are centralized or decentralized. But it turns out that neuroscientists have always believed uh, for the longest time anyway, that our, our memories are stored in one location in the brain and therefore centralized. But they have somewhat recently learned actually that our memories are decentralized and this makes the brain much more resilient. And so our own body's science reflects this conclusion as well, that we operate best in a hybrid kind of structure. And, uh, and then at, at what they really ultimately, or I should say what this, yeah, the, these two authors really ultimately get at is that expect that you're never going to have it perfect. You're going to be in constant search of what they call the sweet spot. And that is that you're constantly trying to figure out like when you get too centralized, how do you bring it back to being a little bit more decentralized and, and um, vice versa. Now, what I learned from this, uh, a lot of things, but a couple of things to share with you is that the structure, having a structure with your team and having particular protocol with your team, such as who does what, when, where, why, all of that. It, while that is often seen of it as being centralized and top down, it's not. It's actually decentralized, and it is the best way to have an efficient, horizontal, like fast moving team that can actually multiply and get things done. The key is that the decisions for those structures, the decisions for the protocol, are actually made in a much more decentralized fashion through consensus as opposed to voting or a top down decision making. Um, what I mean here under learnings, you're not the boss, but it's time to boss up. One of the things I learned when I was volunteering with Wolfpack in California, when I first got started in this, 
I felt really overwhelmed with the title of state leader. I felt like I did not deserve it. and I did not know what the hell I was doing. And I was surrounded by people who were more experienced in politics and policy and way smarter than me. And then I eventually realized that I was hurting the team and thinking that way. And what this book and the others talk about is like, what is true leader? We are all leaders. And my humility, I realized, was actually an inferiority complex. And I learned to step into my power and to be able to see what I had to contribute to the team, which was just as good as everybody else. And that helped my team in so many ways, other people to feel empowered, um, but also to be willing to share my ideas, willing to, no matter how stupid they were, so that we could eventually arrive at, at, at some good ones, right? And so in that way, this is what I mean by confront your Darth Vader, those of you who love Star Wars and like to psychoanalyze it like I do, um, really looking at ultimately yourself and, um, and, and your own shadows, right? And, and, and I have found that even going back to teaching, every time I have become better at whatever it is that I do, I also become a better person. Because one of the things I learned as a teacher is that you teach with who you are. And so I think that applies in every area of our life. You parent with who you are, you show up to your team with who you are, you love with who you are, all of that. So who are you? What do you really believe? And that is going to shine through with with every decision you make and every interaction you have with your team. A quick tip, a couple of very quick tips with um, meetings and projects, just something that you could apply like tomorrow if you wanted without reading these books is these books also talk about how trust is arguably the number one most important thing in your team. And you can really let go of control and demonstrate trust in the smallest of ways that can make the biggest of differences. And one of those I found is to make your meeting notes, your agenda, um, give access to your team to be able to edit them and ask people, start training them so that they, they get used to that protocol to type their own name on that agenda to show to show that they're there. And what that does is it, so, it subtly shows that you trust your team. You trust them to take notes for you when you're talking. You trust them to have access to that information um, at all times. And it really can go a very long way. Uh, I think we probably need to move on to, to questions. I forgot to set my timer to see how long uh, I have gone on for. So I'm just going to say, you know, if there's other questions and whatnot that we can't get to, maybe we can uh, later on here. Uh, Like I said, I could talk about all of these forever. So Mike, do we have any questions? Are you there? Hi again. Sorry for the delay. Michael. Uh, Yes, we sure do. Uh, Let me, let's do one here. Uh, This is from Justin in Ohio. With interstate teams, when is it a good idea to use voting or doodle polls? And when could that be a bad idea? It's a good idea to use voting when you're voting on things like whether or not Jenk should grow a mustache. <laughs> uh, basically things that don't affect the decisions of your team. And otherwise, you should lean towards consensus. And... Um, I'm going to talk, uh, I think it's in the next slide, actually, like some tips on how to do consensus, because that's a very kind of intimidating or scary or exciting, but not really sure how to do it kind of thing for a lot of people. It was for me as well. Um, But I also learned through practicing consensus that I actually have been doing it without even realizing it. So it's possible that you guys have been as well. Great. That's a great question. Okay. You want one more? Yes. Just one more. Uh, Kristen, do you have any idea what, what time, where we're at? Um, we can do one more quick one, but then I got to keep going. Okay. Thank All right. you. Uh, you keep, keep me well, on track. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Uh, what are the best ways to keep people excited and, and enthusiastic about volunteer work when noticeable progress is difficult to come by? It's, it's hard to give a blanket, like one blanket answer on that because there are so many variables and factors. And this is both the exciting challenge of doing what you do, 
and um, the really frustrating part <laughs> of doing what you do as well. So I would say like my, my, my first inclination is to say, have those, that open conversation with your team and, 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 and come back to the table and say, okay, here's where we're at. And here are the challenges and here are the struggles. Uh, do we want to keep going? How do we keep going? Do we need to keep going? Can we agree that we want to? Yes. Can we agree that we need to try something differently? Maybe, maybe you just keep doing the same exact thing, but now it's going to be better because you guys know how to do it better. Um, I, I don't know if that answer helps you because maybe you have already done that, but, um, I would just say that whenever I don't know what to do, I, I look it up online. I listen to podcasts and then I just get really honest and humble and transparent and have those conversations with my team. If I don't know the answer. And if I may add, I mean, it depends on the, the specifics but I, it can also be the way that we measure our wins. And so something as small as maybe getting a meeting with the legislator, celebrating that win. It may not be that you got to committee, but you're still making wins along the way. Oh my gosh, that is such a good point. Because a lot of people, of course, have in their mind and they should, we need to win this, this session, absolutely. Uh, but the reality is that the average piece of legislation takes three to eight years to pass. Uh, we don't want that to take that much time. We don't feel like we have that much time, um, but it takes that long because you make progress each year that you go along and you go backwards each year that you don't push forward. So great point, Kristen. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. So the next book here is free. So you can look it up online. Uh, you will, I think, find opportunities, opportunities to pay for it, but you know, maybe it helps fund him. So you want to do that kind of like a donation to this, this guy who's pretty awesome. But uh, otherwise, when you type it into search for it, search for PDF so that you can um, find that. Anyways, what's great about this book that I really like is he is talking about a, the decentralization of an organization that they did with the Swedish Pirate Party in order to rise into influence and power in Sweden. So interesting. But what I really took from it, actually, that I don't even know whether or not the author himself is aware of, is he's actually talking about a hybrid system. And I think you may see that as well if you start with the previous book, The Starfish and the Spider, that I had just got done talking about. And so with this, um, he also goes into like, what is leadership and, and uh, how, why consensus is he, he's one who really goes into what consensus looks like and how voting can actually ruin your team and why it was, it was kind of mind blowing for me. And, and it, it, it took a lot for me to like, let go of that and introduce that to the TYT army. But I think it was one of the best decisions that we ever made, honestly. And he also goes into core values. So you may know now that Wolfpack has core values. So does TYT, the company, um, but also the TYT army. And a lot of these are, when you read this, come from this, uh, that we're inspired by this. And I'll talk more about those in uh, a few minutes, actually. But um, with the the um, this decentralized theory that he goes into in swarm wise, I think the biggest things I took from this was that he really talks about the what, but he doesn't go into the how. And it took me a while to actually realize that I was having frustrations and I with some things and I'd go back to the book and try to find the tips. And I was like, ah, he's really talking about theory mostly. So I needed to really go and dig when I, when I liked an idea that was presented in the book and find more supplemental information online or just go and try things that I knew, fortunately, with a lot of my teaching background helped me quite a bit. The um, consensus is time consuming. I'm on the second bullet point under learnings uh, is, is time consuming in the front end because of how much time it takes to talk through things and really validate everybody's opinion and question. But the thing is, is once you do that, you have buy-in from the team and now you have an active team instead of a passive team or a passive aggressive team that hasn't bought into the plan that was handed down from one or two people or whatever. And um, they just kind of start and or stop showing up. Maybe they physically show up, but they stop showing up in terms of taking action. So uh, the consensus really goes a very long way. What I mean by untrained in the third bullet point 
if people are asking for your permission, you may be too centralized. Um, we, we are really conditioned in our society to be afraid to make mistakes, to be afraid to get in trouble if we do make a mistake and take a risk. So if you find people coming to you and asking for permission, you may have to untrain them in that conditioning and say, hey, you got this. Like, you can do this just as good, if not better than me. Like, go for it, girl. Okay. But there are some times where discretion is really important. And in those cases, I do express to people, like, thank you for your discretion and asking me about this because they were considering what, how it would affect the integrity of our organization or needing to keep some of our strategies kind of like close to our vest until we were ready to unveil it. So uh, that's kind of that sweet spot that I was referring to from the, the previous book, but something I think to, to really keep in mind. And uh, the fourth one, I asked people to step up. This is something that comes from Swarmwise. I asked people to step up. I went against my instincts and said, okay, here are all these positions as we are beginning this organization. Here's all these positions. Here are all these opportunities. Whoever wants it, go. Well, it was a beautiful disaster, I guess I would call it. I've, I found some amazing leaders that I honestly don't know if I would have found otherwise because I didn't do it otherwise, right? But there was also, as I expected, people who stepped up that I ended up like, it was like toxic stuff I was dealing with um, and took a lot of time and a lot of energy and that affected the other leaders. But at the same time, was that a good thing? Because those leaders saw how to kind of manage those things and learned a lot from those experiences. So hard to say, honestly, you got to kind of figure it out, you know, trial and error, you're going to make mistakes. So over here under tips, what I would say that I learned from that is to kind of have a sweet spot in terms of what's recommended in this book for a structure and, uh, and, and building your team versus the previous one. And that is, uh, he talks about these magic numbers of seven, 30, and 150, I think it is. And seven is the most efficient team. So what I do is I have like levels in, in the organizations and you work your way through the levels based on your experience and desire, capacity, all of those things, right? Um, and then each level or each team has a team lead and those team leads report to and are supported by the other team leads. So if I'm the director of the organization, I have six people who directly report to me. So there's seven of us ultimately working together, but they have six people, same thing with them. This is actually decentralized because you can act, you can make decisions faster and you can get information from people from the bottom, even though you may be here in the organization, you can get more information relayed back to you. It's just so much more efficient in this way. And um, I think finally, I would say when it comes to consensus is that just because you may be a team lead doesn't mean you're exempt from needing to convince the team of your ideas. Your ideas are proposals to the team, just like everybody else. You may already think this. You may already know this. That is fantastic. Sometimes we have to explicitly share that with other people on our team. Sometimes we do have to remind ourselves because we get in this rut and get going. And it's like, I'm the team leader or I'm the one with the most experience. And the reality is if somebody pushes back on my idea or I know I, I go to a meeting and I know I know what I'm talking about and nobody else does, like I know it. And I show up to the team. I say, guys, this is a proposal. I really need your feedback because they may be able to see something that I can't because I'm too close to the decisions. And lo and behold, what I know is the best plan actually wasn't. And that's how you are able to lean on each other's strengths and acknowledge uh, with compassion each other's weaknesses and really build a very strong, sustainable team. All right, do we have any time for a question? Crispin? That's a quick one. Quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question, Mike? Uh, sure, yes, um, we sure do. Uh, I don't know if it's quick or not. Um, well, yeah. one from Armando, why are teachers so awesome? <laughs> Uh, that is, you're right. No, that is actually a very complicated question because there are so many reasons that we don't have time to get into. <laughs> if, someone is by them, if someone finds themselves alone and trying to get a team started in a sustainable way, what should they do? 
read these books. <laughs> uh, because when I first started in California, I was relatively alone. I didn't know anybody else that was like working on stuff. It turned out there was two other people kind of working independently. Nobody was talking to each other. Nobody knew about each other. Eventually we were connected, but I was just kind of like doing everything on my own. And to me, that was faster. And, um, and so I was just, I was just going to pass the legislation by myself. <laughs> and then finally, somebody took me into their wing and was like, yo, girl, this is not how politics works. <laughs> Turns out it's also not how life works. And so I, from there started applying what I learned as a teacher, but you can apply this learning as, you know, as a parent or wherever you're at. Every single decision that I made for that team and I've made for every team has always been for the longevity and sustainability of the team. So if you're one person on your team, but you know that you need five people, do you know you need five people? Do you need two people, three people, four people, five people? Like what are all the things you need done? Like figure out what that structure is. You'll see this in four and wise. Figure out what that structure is. You're going to create all these boxes and all these opportunities for leaders. And then when people show up to your team, like, okay, here are all the things I need. Right now I'm doing all of it. Here's all the things I need. What would you like to help with? And um, that's a very quick way to explain uh, so many things that you can do, but there are lots of opportunities, which is a good thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, Kristen's up. Yeah, so Leader Effectiveness Training. Uh, this was a phenomenal book. Um, I'm going to start off with the point that really resonated with me, and that was being a leader doesn't make you one. And I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have had this experience where we had a boss or someone leading us. Maybe they weren't an effective communicator. Maybe they were they weren't organized or they didn't listen to the needs of their teammates. Um, and so this book talks about um, for you to be a leader, um, there are different skills and strategies that you need that positively impact and facilitate your team. Um, and in doing so, this is how we earn respect and gain acceptance from the team. Um, the book talks about two roles as an effective leader, uh, a task specialist, and then a human relationship specialist. Uh, so the task specialist ensures the team has direction, the resources they need. So the trainings that we have at Wolfpack, bullet points, um, team strategy, and they understand how to accomplish a goal. Um, and the second aspect is human relationship specialist. Now, in this aspect, you're building relationships with the volunteers, resolving issues, um, listening to your teammates' needs, and su successfully motivating your team. Um, one thing Allison pointed out to me when we were going through this that made complete sense was that the task specialist is the strategy, and the human relationship was the culture aspect. And so inadvertently, uh, Dr. Thomas Gordon uh, makes a case for the hybrid structure. and. And under this, there's just some more points in the theory, skills to help group members uh, solve problems, listening skills. You want to make sure that your teammates are being heard. They feel valued. I messaging, uh, not using accusatory language as you didn't do something. It's I noticed this. Um, and resolving conflicts so everyone wins. Um, normally, when we think conflict, we think a winner and a loser. Um, and here, if everybody's heard and participating, we should come up with a solution that benefits everyone on the team. Or when I think of the office, I think of the win-win-win solution where we all win. Um, and then move quickly because we're women on time. Um, you know, a group-centered, collaborative approach. Um, everyone's needs are being met. Um, jumping down to the fourth point uh, requires self-reflection and being open to others' perspectives. Um, and this goes into what Allison was talking before, you know, being able to reflect and look at um, maybe for you it's control or maybe it's um, being able to reflect on um, I'm strong as a task specialist, but when it comes to understanding my team or listening, these are things that I need to identify. It's okay that you're not strong in them, but utilizing some of the tips to help you improve. Um, and then facilitation and guidance. I underline these points because to me, they're really important and go back to, to what Allison said. You're there to facilitate, to guide the conversation, make people feel comfortable and welcome. And you're not there to dictate what 
what the organization does, what your team does. You know, we, we work together and come up with a plan. Um, some of the tips, um, fostering open and honest communication. We've talked about you give examples. Um, be honest when you don't know something. We have a great example of this when you go meet a state legislator. It's okay to not know the answer, um, but you let them know that you're going to come back to them with the answer. Um, and let your team know if you've made a mistake. Um, taking ownership is really important. For human beings, we make mistakes, and you know, we need to take ownership for that. Um, empower others and model behavior. Um, like we talked about, don't just give a solution, ask for input. Uh, we can empower our teammates. This is something simple you can start doing, and you probably already do it, but thanking your teammates when they uh, offer to take on a task or they've accomplished it. This makes them feel valued. This makes them feel appreciated. Um, another important one is, um, let's say you're on a team call and someone normally is very engaged, they speak, and you notice a subtle difference in their behavior, um, reaching out to them. Maybe there's something personal going on, or maybe it's relevant to the team that they didn't feel heard. And so letting them know that you care about them, you're here for them, it, it opens up a conversation if, if there's something going on. Um, asking questions to ensure uh, you understand something. We may think we understand something, but sometimes, oh, um, Scott, the Florida State Organizing Director, does a great job with this. If you express something to him, he'll restate it to you in his own words to ensure that he understands the content. Um, and just asking questions if, if you need something to be clarified. Uh, I versus you statements, like we talked about before, um, don't accuse someone and say, you didn't finish this. Ha open up a dialogue. I noticed you didn't meet the deadline. I noticed you, you didn't update your sheet. Is there anything that I can do to help you? Maybe we didn't provide them um, to be successful. Maybe there's something lacking and we've opened up the line of communication for them to talk with us. And I can talk on and on about this, but I know we got to get moving. Do we have any questions, Mike? Hey, we do. They're a little bit, I think they're going to take some time though. Uh, one of them is about AJR1. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one that you might, that might be, you might be able to answer in, in a decent amount of time. Uh, I'll give that one to you. When using your skills for conflict resolution, how transparent should you be with the team that you're doing that? Should you say, okay, y'all, here's what we need to do to resolve this? Or should you navigate through that without announcing it? Comes from Justin in Ohio, Viking. Chris, do you want to? I'm going to let you get that one. It's always difficult for me to answer questions about each particular kind of situation because there's no cookie cutter answer. There's unfortunately like no, not even a right or wrong answer. It depends on the situation. Um, I think the best way, the, the best advice, if I, if I was forced to answer this question with my feet over like coal, <laughs> I would say, what I try to do in my position with, with being like a, a team lead is to stay in the background and guide my team leads on how to handle the situation when they come to me for help. That happens a lot. Like, and people will come to me and say, I don't like the way this person did this. It's like elementary school. I don't like this. I don't like this. Somebody did this. Somebody said that. And but other people are like legit just being like, hey, Allison, I need to like let you know, like someone's talking mad smack on somebody or something or somebody's like over here. We had the strategy and they're over here derailing it because they disagree and they're doing something like completely counterproductive. And so what I do is I go back to the core values, which we're going to which is actually going to be the next thing that we're going to talk about. And I talk to that person and say, okay, like, where is it in here that we can like figure out how to address this? And do you feel comfortable addressing this yourself? I try to empower people to take it um, directly to the source. And if they still want some help or advice, I'll do that with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, once in a while, it gets to the point where they're like, no, I really want you there in that room and in that meeting to be able to kind of facilitate that conversation because we're not hearing each other. 
And what I'm explaining right now is actually all in leaders in, in the leader effectiveness training book that Christian just got done talking about. You'll, you'll, you'll read all about this advice. So I think the book itself can really help to answer your question, but I've actually done it and it has changed my life because I no longer am doing everything and being every one for everyone. <laughs> so I'm able to sleep now, which is fabulous. And things are going even better as a result. Well, congratulations on your being able to sleep. Yeah. I can only inspire. You should try it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll, we'll stop there for questions. Okay. Oh, Mike, I'm sorry. I forgot to put the, the Q&A up here. I forgot. Well, it's oh, payback. It's payback. It's fine. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> this last one here, we're going to finish off talking about the core values. First of all, I just want to start by saying we are so on time. We are so awesome, Kristen. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Watch, I'm going to totally go over um, just for saying that. Anyways, these core values come from Swarmwise, the second book that I talked about. And I, I, it was one of my favorite things to try from this book. It was a completely new concept for me. And it's really like getting away from the concept of having like rules in a space that you either work in or volunteer with in or participate in online or whatever. These are the rules. If you don't follow them, we've got moderators in here that are going to like pop you on the head and you're gone. Instead, you have values that really help people to reflect on going back to that Darth Vader, like, am I actually showing up in this space the way that I expect other people to? And when times get tough, because I always say uh, it's easy for people to be happy and to be positive and to be determined when things are easy and good. It's when shit hits the fan that your true character comes out. So who are you really? And that, and these core values will really help you with that. If they don't, then please tell me your secret because it did for me. It really helped me. Um, oh, did we lose? Did you guys lose me? No. Nope. Can you still see my screen? It is, but it's not in presenter mode anymore. So just change it to presenter right. mode. Top right. Right. Oh, it's not in presenter mode anymore? Yeah. So you yeah. can't see the screen. Put it back in presenter mode and you'll be good. Oh, oh, oh. There. Is that it? Yep, you you're good. That? Yay, awesome. So um, so that it it really, really helped me to make sure that I'm living and leading by my values and checking in with my values and who I am. Because I believe anyway that the world that we're fighting for one of peace and compassion and equality and forgiveness and acceptance and love is the culture, the society that we need to have now. Like we need to show how to embody that now in order to actually get there is my philosophy. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sure I'm not the only one who shares that. And these core values like really help your team to reflect on that. Um, because there's, there's a lot of toxic shit in our, in our society. Let's be real. Right. With, uh, with a lot of things going on. So it means that it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging, but it'll be so rewarding and so fun. I promise. At least it was for me. Now in the beginning, when I first introduced these to the TYT army, there were definitely people who were, who thought they were cheesy and some people said it and most people didn't. Uh, I call myself psychic. Mike says it's just intuition <laughs> or, or intelligence or whatever, but I'm pretty sure I'm psychic and I can tell what people are thinking. And, and I could, I mean, it's, it was very obvious that people were pushing back against it, but I stood my ground, not in a, in a dictatorial way by any means, but I knew that this is what was needed after all of my experience in, in so many ways. And I told people, I know this feels weird going into your meetings and having it at the top of your agenda and leading the meetings with this and having a discussion about this core value and that core value. I promise you, please have patience. This is where I was really transparent about this, right? I promise you're going to see it and show, show enough what ended up happening 
was people's masks started coming down. The longer people were working with each other and stuff started to got, get real, not just with our organization, but in their lives. And because you can only keep those masks up for so long and you start to see people fighting and the infighting and that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, the people I was working directly with were like, oh my gosh, now I get it. Now I see why this is so important. And now we are about a year and a half into using these core values. And it was so much work for me in the beginning, but now it's so much more decentralized than anything I've ever participated in because it's part of the culture. It's not anything I'm walking around trying to teach and train everybody. Everybody has internalized it and embodied it. And when somebody new comes in and doesn't, people jump in with compassion and patience, acceptance, and, and a welcoming attitude to be like, hey, man, we don't do that here. Sorry. <laughs> right? It's so beautiful. I can't begin to like, and there's so many, so many examples I have that have, have proven that this was definitely well worth it. And so there's some tips over here on, on the right of uh, what we did to try and roll it out. I can tell you that now that we've been doing it for a while, it does get to a point where like, sometimes it can kind of be like a little bit much and you can only think of like so many creative ways possible. And the author here says, as well as does a lot of uh, suggestions out there and like even the corporate culture, you can't just post your values, even your rules, your mission, your vision. You can't just post that stuff and expect people to believe in it. Uh, you have to live it. And that means revisiting it in authentic ways. But like how authentic and how creative can you get for the rest of your life with a team? So lean on other people to, um, to take ownership of it and to do things with it for a certain period of time once it's rolled out, I would say. So you get kind of a break and you can see what other people do. And, uh, and that's, that's probably, I'll stop there because we, I think are out of time when we have five minutes left for questions. Okay. Yes, oh, you do. Oh, oh, I did want to say one more oh. thing. One All right. Last. Go ahead. Go for it. Uh, Rick Falfinch, who wrote Swarmwise and where uh, this concept of the core values comes from, he he suggests there's no mandate at all uh, in there, but he suggests that there's two documents. There's one for your team and there's one for the leaders. And I just want to say, I decided not to do that. So this is where, you know, like, you read this stuff, you interpret it the way you want and try stuff and some stuff's going to fail and some stuff is going to like blow your mind and change the world or at least your world. Right. And so my philosophy was that if it's true that we are all leaders, regardless of title, and I believe that we are, then why would we have a separate leadership document? What is that telling the team? So anything that I would want to put on a leadership document I put on the team document so that we're all thinking about ourselves as either perceived leaders or official leaders, but really taking ownership over every single thing that we do. So that was the last thing I wanted to say. What, what questions do we have? Okay. Uh, well, let's do the AGR one, one, because I think that people can learn from it. So uh, okay. this one. I was, well, I was like three lifetimes ago. So I'll see if I remember. I bet you do. Uh, when AGR one died in California and the sponsor was not pushing it, how did you revive it? Both how did you get the team motivated to bring it back? And how did you get the legislature to revive something that they considered dead? I watched it happen <laughs> from the other side of the country. I know who's asking. I still question. don't know how you guys did it. That's from Sam. I so know. <laughs> and it's funny that it's Sam because I was gonna say, I think Sam can best answer this question. <laughs> okay. Um, so the question is a little bit of context for those of you who don't really know what, what um, he's talking about is the our legislation in California, the name of it was AJR1. And it died so many times, you guys. Oh my gosh. Honestly, I have forgotten how many times it died and how many times I brought it back to life until Sam reminded me, Sam with Wolfpack, when I was running for office. Sam sent me the most, one of the most like amazing messages that gave me so much um, confidence running for office because I, I, I kind of forgot, I lost sight of the, all of those details. And he told me, he's like, I saw you 
take that legislation. It died. Everybody knew it was dead. And every single time you brought it back to life, you did that. You did that. You can do this. And of course I didn't do it by myself, but it was a really good reminder that what, and something Jen pointed out to me as well that I didn't realize it had a lot to do with my attitude. And I I think it's just the attitude I naturally bring to most things that I do is like, yeah, no, of course we're going to do this. There's no other option. Of course we're going to. Um, uh, uh, And of course that you can't just like wish on a, on a star and things will happen. You have to fight like hell. And I did, but every single time there was a roadblock, we would get back on a call, the team and I, and there were definitely members on the team who were way more cynical than I was. But I wasn't deterred by that because their cynicism was really needed for the team. We fit like a like a puzzle, all of us, what we contributed, all of our strengths and weaknesses. Their cynicism helped us think through things that I wouldn't. And um, and my optimism of being like, no, of course there have to be other options. Of course there have to be other options. So I, go, I, I can't go into the details necessarily of it. We don't have enough time. And um, I mean, it was a very long year. And what I did or what our team did to make that happen is going to be different from what like your team will do. And of course, the examples could help you. But I would just say that it came down to just never giving up. We just we just always got back together and we said, okay, what are our options? And when we didn't know, um, we would ask. We would just ask people. I would I would talk to Mike. I would talk to uh, our other director at the time who was here. I would talk to other people that I could. I would look it up online, and I just I just never ever stopped. I don't know if that helps or not, but. Yeah, well said. No, I think it is attitude, actually. If you have the right attitude, you're going to just keep going and you're going to figure it out, you know? And yeah. uh, I think that's a good answer. We have, uh, I know we're kind of out of time here. You only have like a minute, but it's a good question. And I think you can answer it quickly, I hope. Uh, it's from Josh Hall. What is a good way to keep your team talking if you have a quiet team who doesn't get much feedback during meetings? That's a good one. Kristen, I, I, I feel bad answering all the questions. Do you want to take this? No pressure. I'll take a moment. You can, you can start. Okay. One of the things I had on one of these slides, and it's okay if we go a couple minutes over. John gave me permission. He's up, he's up next. <laughs> he barely um, gave you permission. He barely gave me permission, but <laughs> I'm taking it. Because that's the attitude I have. I'm going to take what I can get. Uh, a, a talkative team is a really, really good sign of a successful team. So I love that you asked, what do I do about the fact that my team is not talkative and not participating? And I I continue to have these struggles with uh, teams that I work with. What I always do is I step back and ask, okay, what is it that causes a team to be quiet? And then I ask, what is it that causes a person to be quiet? And then I start to see what I can do to make some changes around that. So some things, this is not an exhaustive list. Some things that cause people to be quiet is they're afraid of embarrassing themselves and being wrong. They're afraid of asking a dumb question. They're afraid of um, being punished for saying something maybe that somebody already said or saying something again that makes them look stupid. And um, and then other things that another thing that, that causes the team to be quiet is if the culture that does come back to culture instead of strategy if the culture is to get on the meetings and just talk at people the whole time and just go through your agenda, just like riddle through it and then be done and be like, okay, any questions? And everybody's so exhausted. They're like, no, nah, I'm good. Or just come in and tell people what to do. Okay, team, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. This is when we're doing it. Any questions? Your team is going to become so passive, so quiet. And eventually they're going to lose motivation because nobody has any say. They're going to be bored and they're going to feel like, what is the point of me even being here? So you have to change that around. And if the team's already like that, you, and I, again, I've done this myself even recently. So figure out ways to adjust. These books actually talk about it. I really recommend that you read them. But some things you can start with right away is like help the team build the agenda for you. Um, make sure that you stop after each section during the meeting and ask for feedback. 
be willing to have uncomfortable silence, call people up by name. Hey, Kristen, um, I want to ask you a, a question, but I want to give you some time to think about it. Um, but what do you think about this strategy? I really want to hear from you because I know you have ex your experience as a teacher could possibly help us. I'll get back to you in a minute. But hey, uh, Mike, I wanted to talk to you about something. So now I'm giving Kristen some time to think about it, but she knows I'm coming back to her. I better come back to her. I got so many tips and tricks for this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but but I hope that helps at least a little. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add real quick. Um, identifying two, maybe they don't feel engaged in the conversation, looking at the skills form, if there's something that they connect with, getting them to engage in an activity or participating in a way that they feel is meaningful. Um, or even when talking about the agenda, we like to incorporate, it's not just me talking or, or Scott talking, you know, everybody who's working on it, each covers a part. So we're collectively um, speaking during, during our calls. Okay. That's it. We'll wrap it up there. Yeah, okay. I think that's it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. Both of you for being here today. Uh, that was a really informative panel, and I hope Thanks our, our team... guys are doing. Thanks for having yeah. us. Of course, yeah, I'm sure our teams are, are going to benefit from that training. So, uh, yeah, we we really appreciate it. So, uh, now we're going to just break for a couple minutes. We're going to come back with the last couple panels of the entire weekend. Uh, John Chen is going to kick it off. We're going to transition into planning for a committee hearing mode. And we're actually going to have a mock committee hearing coming up where uh, our bunch of our volunteers are going to participate. Jenks going to come back, Larry Lessig, and we're going to pair off against each other. And the audience is going to get to decide who moves forward. And there will be just one champion by the end in the next. Are couple you doing hours. it, Mike? What's that? Are you are you participating? In I it? am. Go get them. I am. It should be a lot of fun. Mike for the win. Is there a trophy for the winner? Uh, I didn't make one. I should have. I know I did for the Pictionary. I, I, maybe, maybe uh, I'll make one later. Um, if I win. We'll see who wins. That'll if Mike wins, there will be a trophy, I think is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to remind people, though, if you want to participate in those live polls, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's wolf-pack.com slash workshop to get your tickets. Time is definitely running out for that, but it's, it will be worth it. And uh, the silent auction is going to end in just one hour. So, like I've said before, a timeshare is on there for a whole week. Um, uh, jewelry, all kinds of cool stuff. So, you go to wolf com slash live for that. And uh, we've raised over $10,000 so far. I think we're actually up over 11000 now. So, thank you. And if you want to keep that going, that's wolf com slash 28. 28 for the 28th Amendment. Um, and that'll take you to the, the donate page. So, we appreciate it. And uh, thank you again, Allison. Thank you again, again, Kristen. 